Okay, so let's so, talk again and now start with you again to keep talk. Thank you. Yes, so thank you. If you are new, welcome. If you are not new, welcome back. Uh, so I'm going to unofficially conclude the, the, the course on uh, equilibrium state through potential theory. But I, I will start with a recap and the motivation and the main statement. And I will recap what we did last week, which more or less was to build uh, the technical tools that we need. And today we will hopefully prove the main theorem of, uh, that we wanted to prove. So the setting is the following. We have F from P1 to P1, which is the rational map. Uh, just take from F from C to C a polynomial if this is uh, you are more comfortable. The, the main property we are using from this map is that they are these ones. Okay, for every point you have deeper images counted with multiplicity. Okay, now the general motivation, the general problem that we are trying to address, uh, I gave the motivation in uh, more precisely, but in practice, is the following you are given a point Z, okay, in C, you are taking a, a delta mass here, okay, a delta mass, a Dirac mass at the point, okay. Then you replace this measure with a measure which is the following. Suppose that you have your deeper images of your point, okay, and you replace, call them Z1. Z2, Z3, and you replace this measure here with delta, delta here, delta here, over three, over three, over three. Okay, this was a probability measure. This is the, what is called your pullback of this measure. Okay, you replace this by a delta on the pre images, and now you divide by the number, generally z, in order to have again a probability measure. Okay, the question is if I iterate this again, if I take another step. Another step here. I know that per image of points, let's say generically, go toward the Julia set, the accumulated the Julia set. Can I? Is it true that I have some limit here in the in uh, the construction? So the theorems that uh, let's say the theorem one uh, that I wanted to that we discussed in uh, during this course uh, is that uh, there exists uh, an invariant measure probability. New whose support is the Julia set. And if you don't want to know what is the Julia set, you, you will take the Julia set as the support of this measure. It will be well defined. Such that, uh, let's say, for uh, almost every z in uh, P1 or in C, if you want, uh, if I take, uh, uh, let me call uh, this one, let me call it mu. Z zero, this one here, the sum of the delta here, let me call it mu Z one. In general, let me say that mu Z n is the sum on uh, the points W. It is it's Z of delta W, and then divided by the n. Okay, this is the probability measure, the sum of all the pre-images and then divided by the number. There exists the measure such that the limit as n goes to infinity of mu dn is equal to mu for almost every point. Almost every point can be precise, it's not the point here in the, in the course. But the idea is that it's essentially independent. So first of all, there is a limit, okay? If you start with a point, you get uh, an invariant measure in the limit, okay? Invariant measure, let me recall, that means that for every a, mu of a is equal to mu of f minus one of a. We commented on why this condition is important in dynamics. Uh, so there is, for every point you take, essentially, you have this limit, and this limit doesn't depend on the point, OK? These, uh, if you want, one can study the measure of maximal entropy, but we will not uh, use this in this course. Now, did we discuss the proof of this in, uh, in, in the second lecture? And uh, the point is that uh, this uh, convergence here is somehow explicitly explicit okay if you test for example mu z n minus mu against the spy which is the case let's call it maybe uh, h which is uh, 
uh, C2, a C2 function, okay? This one, every, oh yes, every time I write uh, uh, new G, this is the notation for the integral of G against new, because in the course we use a lot of uh, duality. But this integral here, okay, this, this goes to zero, but the point is not only for a fixed IH, this one goes to zero, but this is small up to some constant of H, the non C2, and uh, let's say one over D N for uh, every delta which is less. So it's almost the, the speed, if you want, is almost the power. Okay, it's explicit. So this is the, the theorem that we said that, that we, we discussed it's used by Brolin and Liu, which in dimension one now, and uh, for Messi Bonibri and Duval and this in higher dimension, essentially. So this was the starting motivation. Okay. So we construct an invariant measure by full buffer points. Okay. The fact that it's invariant is because at every step it's easy to say that if I take mu, uh, let's say if I take mu mu z n plus one, I do the f star of this uh, like the, the push forward of the mass. Okay, just the delta goes to the, to the image. This one is equal to the next. If you pass this to the limit, you see that the limit will be in bound. Now, this is the, the theorem that you addressed. Now, the question is the following. If instead of having uh, this construction here, let me take uh, now phi from P1 to R of some regularity, or again, take C2 for, for simplicity. Now, instead of replacing Z, the delta here with the pre images, let me say that I multiply by this uh, times E power phi of this. E power phi of this point, uh, E power phi of this point. Okay, I take it back, I, I pull back, uh, and now instead of uh, uh, of taking just the sum of, of the three Dirac masses, okay, I put a weight, what they call a function, a weight, uh, and uh, I put other weights in this, okay? I, I, can, I can change this. Now, the, the question how now becomes if I have a point, uh, let me take just the one of, I mean, I have all the inverses. Let me take just one inverse branch like this. At the step n, what I'm putting here? I am putting the delta of this point here, but I multiply times e phi of this plus phi of the image plus phi of f element one. Okay, this is w, step of w, step of w. Okay, because at every step I have to replace what I have by I pull back the delta, okay, I put another mass, and I multiply by in the new value that phi takes in, in an extra pre image. Okay, so I have this. Uh, I start with a point, and I can ask the question is it true that now, given a function phi, is it still true that for almost every point, let's say, this converts to some measure which is, uh, which is uh, interesting in some sense? We discussed in the first lecture how, why this problem is related to studying the statistics of the function phi. Okay, if you want this one, this sequence here, you, you can see it, for example, through the, uh, the Birkov average of, uh, of, of the function phi along an orbit. We discussed why studying this problem is related to understanding what is called the statistic of, the, of this map. We will not enter in this detail here, but I will just want to state again the, the, the theorem. So the theorem show that I want to come in front here. Uh, let's say then uh, this is key. Bansky and uh, Urbanski. And is that uh, there exists a uh, an invariant measure. Let me say, if phi is, uh, for example, C2, for simplicity, we discussed this regularity in the course, I will not discuss on the regularity today. We take phi, which is C2, which is a simple case, and the max of phi minus the minimum of phi of P1, again, let's say a simple possible case, is less than the logarithm of the degree of the mass. Okay? Take phi with this condition. So it means that it's, Sufficiently smooth, takes C2 for now. 
And also, it does not oscillate too much in, too, too much in your system. We will see why we use this in the construction. Take this, this consumption here. Then there exists an invariant measure. Look, V is good for maximum measure. And if you have some pressure. Sorry? Is it the right assumption if you consider measure weight phi not maximum? It's not the optimal one. It's one for which I'm sure it will work for every rational map. Okay, in a, in a, for example, I could ask only the max minus the minimum on the Julia set, for example. I mean, it could be improved, but let me just take with the simplest, uh, simplest example. And, uh, and let me also assume to simplify the statement that F has no periodic critical points. Again, it's not necessary, but in the construction, it will be simpler. So in this case, uh, uh, there exists an invariant measure mu phi. Again, uh, the support of mu phi is equal to the Julia set. And there exists a number lambda, which is positive, such that, uh, uh, so lambda positive, a, a function rho from P1 to R at least continues, such that if I take, uh, uh, let me maybe change a bit the notation. Let, let me not put the, let me write in this way. Z, phi Z N, lambda minus N, limit N go to infinity. So here I define uh, mu phi the n as the sum of f and w which is equal to z of delta w e phi w phi f minus one of them. Okay, I just don't do, here in the definition I have divided by the dn, but here I don't divide by the dn because this will be the, the new number. This one here is equal to rho of z, so this depends on the point now, times m phi, which is the measure, and m of phi is equal to one over rho, the function, in the positive function, multiplied by mu. So the limit is not precisely an invariant measure, but up to a, con a, a, a continuous density, okay? This one is this one. Okay, up the continuous function, the limit goes to D. Okay, so this is the, the theorem that we discussed. And uh, now, again, you can quantify this speed uh, if you take, again, sufficiently regular uh, functions. Okay, so this is uh, the first statement. Again, so if I play this game of replacing uh, points by the, by the pre-image and putting the delta and putting this accumulated weight, uh, again, I converge towards some measure, okay? Then we can study why this measure is interesting, or uh, but it's not the point. This is the this is the construction. Okay, so this backward pre-image, pre-image, pre-image works also in this case. Now, so the yes. is uh, yes, yes, yeah, I didn't want to. Yes, yes, yes. Also, we are not have time today, but yes, in dimension one, yes, you can say this is a conformal measure. Now, when I will say the operator, I will say the yes. But the point is that it's not invariant. Okay, this is the invariant measure. You divide by these and you get this measure here, and this is the measure for which you toward which you distribute. So it has to be multiplied by this continuous function to get the invariant measure. Okay, so this is the second one. And uh, the main point here is to explain. Uh, I still we didn't prove it, eh? so it will be done uh, today. We proved this in the lecture two, three, how to do this uh, theorem. For phi equals zero, if you want to go and see the recording, for phi equals zero, which means in some sense reproving this. But with the method that now we will see that works also if phi is not zero. Okay? So we already seen, so a bit the method works for phi equals zero, which a priori it simplifies because it's just this statement. But uh, we, now we will see why the same method will work for phi different forms. And more, more important than this, uh, how we can quantify this convergence. 
So the theorem three. Three. Same assumption, okay? I take F, I take phi, I take the same assumption, F, phi, whatever. There exists a, a banner space E and the norma. The important point is the norma. So let's say for every gamma, what I'm going to say, for every gamma between zero and one, there exists a norm with the, which bounds the continuous norm, which is zero is uh, the complete. Yeah? This uh, is my norm and it's bound by the norm holder. Okay, there exists a norm dominated by the order form. And such that, uh, if phi is less than infinity, for example, if phi is older, then the operator L phi, which is defined as F star e power phi, I will say it better in a moment, as an isolated eigenvalues. Lambda, the same lambda of multiplicity one and spectral. Let me comment uh, later. And uh, also, let me say that if you, I will not enter in this play, but if u is also smaller, L e plus d u. So a small perturbation of phi has the same property. <clears throat> so this property here is not only true for phi, but the same norma will work also for a perturbation of phi. That's incredible. Now, here I should define a number of things. Uh, uh, so in order to, to do it, uh, We discuss the following, which is uh, so given a measure, we say that uh, let me call the DZ and let, let me define by Fn star of Z this operator of pulling back. Okay, I take a delta, I replace by the D pre images, the D pre images again. If this goes to mu, okay, some measure, this is equivalent to say by duality. That if I take G, let's say C2 continues some regularity, if I take this operator and I divide by the n, this goes towards some constant that depends on G, which is the integral against me. The point is that if, so what is this operator? If F star of G at the point Y is equal to the sum of G of X, for the point L is equal to one. Okay, I replace the value of a function with the value of the privileges. Okay, this is the dual operator of this one. Okay, you can say that the result of this over a function g is equal to d n uh, delta c and f n star of g. Okay, this is just the duality. Or I pull back the, the measure, or I pull forward the function. So the method in order to prove this theorem, a possible method, is to prove this one. If you want to prove this convergence, you take a function and you push forward the function. Okay. 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 So if I can prove the convergence of this put forward, okay, toward the constant, 
towards this constant here, then this is the constant that depends linearly on my function, in particular, it defines the measure. Okay, and so then I can define my I can define my measure in this way. Now, suppose now that uh, I don't pull back this operator here, but I do this one. Okay, instead of pulling back the Dirac mass, uh, I pull back uh, the by putting weights. Okay, the fact that uh, mu n mu phi c n converted to mu phi, okay, with lambda minus n, is equivalent to say that uh, if I take, uh, uh, let's say, f n star of e phi plus phi in the image, phi is f minus one of this, uh, of a function g, divided by lambda minus n, goes to some function. This is in duality. If I can build this one, but by pull back, okay, it's equivalent to say that by duality, by push forward, by up to putting all the weights here, this converges to a function. Okay, now you can see that if I define my operator, which is a transfer operator in this way, okay, which means uh, L phi of G at the point Y, is the sum on fx equal y of e phi x g of x. Okay, I replace with the value of the function of the pre images multiplied by this weight. This one here becomes L of iterated n times. Okay, and so if I can prove that the transfer operator iterated n times goes and divided by the good number goes to rho, some function, this is equivalent to prove this one. Sorry, here I should have put this one here. Because then, once you, once you divide by rho, this one becomes a new one. But the point is, if you want to prove this convergence here, the point is by duality to prove that take function, you push forward, then you go towards a, a function. Okay? This is the idea. Instead of pull back, I push forward. Now, what does this mean? Sure. Any estimate, so to say, implied, for example, you have gamma z. On the implied? But it's not, so you have gamma z. It is a number, right? Gamma is a number, yes. Yeah. It's the only. Or any ideas of how one can get any estimates of this particular number, for example. Here? Yeah. Ah, this depends on it. Yes, I know. It's <laughs> So if, if, if F is, for example, if F is hyperbolic, this is essentially you can take, uh, uh, I mean, the point is more than the cost. This is not older, this is the point. I'm saying it's bounded by the older norms. So in some sense, the constant here, it's, uh, it's not really the point. For example, if I'm saying, uh, suppose that it was uh, a gamma prime holder, which is not the case. Uh, the constant for which a gamma prime holder is bounded by a gamma holder, it's not really the point. The point is the exponent. So maybe we will discuss the regularity of this. The constant here, I don't see it as a just even just a matter of rescaling the coordinates. This, this way the sign, it is not back in the coordinates, it is not in the coordinates, it's a constant, right? So here, yeah. yes, but I mean, I could redefine this norm to an equivalent norm divided it's by a constant. Yes, but it's not the older norm. The point is that it's not older. There will be some 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 derivative inside. So it's the point is that it's not older. We have not defined what this norm actually is. No, I think that it exists, and we are going to define today. You will see the constant. We will, I will define the norm in uh, maybe in half an hour, one hour. I define what is this norm on Friday. When phi equals zero, and still in that case, it's not the older norm. So, what does phi equal zero? Zero? Uh, but why is it? If I don't put phi, this goes back to the theorem to the measure of maximal entropy. Uh, this becomes the operator of stars. Now, in this case, I, I discussed what is the norm in the lecture of 203. And again, it's not the older norm. It's weaker than the older norm a priori and depends on F. But I will try today to give the definition in general. So I'm not rewriting the, the definition by what's Okay, can I just ask some questions? So if I cannot hold on, 
but is there any space which contains uh, the functions, which contains functions? Yes, here. Like, I mean, this is this is some norm. Yes. Okay, and that's a basic order norm. Yes. We have an order. Yes, okay. Uh, is there any function space one can think about which contains functions from both this by this norm is defined and so you, you, you mean improving C0? Uh, Putting more precise than C0? Yeah, something yes. like that. This is the long norm for which we discussed two hours uh, last week. Okay. But I don't want to, uh, we will see later. But yes, there is another norm. I will define it in a moment, which is a kind of the old, it's weaker than the older, but still gives a compact space. Okay. It's a compact, in particular, this defines a compact space once you take the normal feature. The, the, this one is a compact space. I mean, the, those of normal one, let's say. Okay. It's a, so there is an explosive So they have this last week's No, 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 no. I mean, this is why I just want to say the theorem, and then at some point I will get to what is that. I didn't want to say log p precisely because there are no people. But, uh, okay. it's, for now, it's enough to, to say this is zero for now. Okay. I will see the construction when it, when it comes out. But the point here is that uh, when you have this convergence here, the idea is that the better you understand this convergence, the better you quantify, for example, in some norm, the better control you have on this, the more properties you have on the limit measure. Okay? Now, this is something we will not discuss now, but what is the best possible scenario in which you can control this convergence? The best possible scenario, scenario is that you have your norm, your Banach space, infinity dimensional, you have a line. E, which is generated by rho, okay? I'm sorry, here it didn't say, but uh, if you use white chalk, you prefer, okay, okay. I, so let me say here that L, my operator L of rho, is equal to lambda of rho. It's a consequence of this, but it's a, let me say, way. So here I have an invariant line by my operator L star. LP. In particular, if this is zero, let's say that this is rho, LC of rho divided by lambda is equal to rho. Okay, so this line is fixed because rho is invariant, the constants of multiplied by rho are invariant. Okay, and then if I take any complement here, any complement, this norm, here I have an exponential. Spectral gap means this that now the, the gap, the, the, the spectrum. On, this, on the on the complement here of, of for my dynamics is uh, let's say the modulus of the spectrum is bounded by some r which is less than one because I already divided by that. okay so it means that if I want to study the iterator of my operator I have an invariant line okay and all the rest is contracted exponentially fast in this norm towards the invariant line this uh, we discussed in, uh, in lecture one it is a kind of best possible control you can expect on in this form. Now, so this is the statement. Okay. Now I would like to uh, to say, try to give a proof, and this is the idea of how we can prove theorem two. Okay, with a method that can be quantified in order to get theorem three. Okay. In particular, it means getting the convergence here, and then find the norm in which we we can control this convergence. And if possible, getting uh, the so that you will be finding a norm for which if you take the transfer operator minus uh, uh, let's say CG rho, this is the suppose that uh, you know, let's simplify suppose G has integral zero with M phi. So G suppose it has no component of this line, okay, mm -hmm. inside here the, the complement. If you, if you apply this one, it's less than beta. Let's know. Okay, so for function with zero integral, we want to find the norm for which the operator becomes a contraction. Okay, this then will give all the possible statistics. But this is the point. So we want to find the construction here that will give. This. Okay, now.
Now, one of the points here of the of the construction is that uh, if we start with phi equals zero, okay, here I already know that lambda will be t. Okay, I don't have to guess. Uh, lambda for which you have to divide the number of frame at every step is t. Here, one of the main points is to get what is this lambda. Okay, <laughs> no one says that uh, the behavior of this sequence L n phi of g is, uh, let's say, asymptotically to some lambda n. I have no idea why a priori this should be true, okay? We could use some abstract theorem, but the problem of using the abstract theorem, fixed point theory or whatever, is that uh, they will work quite well than if you want to, to study the perturbation. We don't know how the fixed point stays uh, if, uh, if then we will perturb this one. And we want something very uniform. So we try not to use fixed point theorems, but lambda is the, the exponential pressure. Yes, 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 yes. But we want to define it to do with you want to find it. Yeah. Sorry? G is anything at the point, right? G is, what is G? Sorry. G is a function. Yes, G function. Yes. Yes, yeah, we will use fixed for simplicity. That takes it true. Every time I, I will do today, it, I will do for C2 function, okay? So all the object that I put will be kind of well-defined. But, but not any stuff. It doesn't have any actualization. I'm thinking like, it is not in the form It will not be? Not, it is not in the form for any sequences. Not, a, I mean, a posteriori it has to, we have to find the norm for which this will work yes, for all right. the function <laughs> in this norm. I mean, a posteriori. I mean, we can start with the C2 function, but the point is the norm in which you estimate. It's not the, the test itself. We want to find the norm for which this one is false. Uh, and the norm will define the function that we use. And we have to make it work. The point is that, the point is that we don't have yet the norm. We want to define the norm. Oh, but then you, have some, you will define the norm for five. Ah, yes, and then, yes, sorry, 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 sorry. Yes, yes, I mean, sorry, uh, yeah, uh, sorry, and then it's already the eigen value lambda, blah, 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 uh, this on E. So for the same norm. Yes, 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 sorry, sorry, sorry the same norm. You have it's an equivalent one, but it's the same. Yes, so it's the same norm. So you don't need to do C2. No, I'm just saying that for the method, when I start to construct the norm, I start doing estimate for C2 functions. And then I check in which norm they, they really converge. And this will define the space a posterior. And I have to make sure that all the steps that I do actually are true for the final space I use. In particular, if I use DTC, they, it has to be very well defined. OK, now. So the starting point. So since we cannot. Uh, uh, we don't know already the, the rate at which we have to divide the sequence. Okay, we don't know lambda. What we do is the following. Okay, so we take pi in speech two for simplicity. Okay, we take g. Let's take the function one. So even simpler. Okay, I just take the function one. I, I don't expect that the, the constants are invariant. So the point is that I have to find the function rho. A posteriori, whichever function I take, the limit will be the same. So let's take the simplest one, okay? The function uh, g equal one, constant. And uh, I define one n to be ln phi of the function one, okay? So this is the sequence we want to study, okay? We want to find the lambda for which if we divide this by lambda power n, it goes towards some functional pro, okay? And then we want to understand the speed and, 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 and the norm. Okay, we want to find lambda and rho such that one n over lambda goes to some function rho. Okay, if, if this is true, if there is the convergence, okay, so this is the problem. Find lambda and rho such that we have this one. Now, since we don't have lambda, uh, we start with the following. We cannot normalize. I mean, we, we need to normalize at some point, otherwise things in general when we go to infinity. So let's define one star n, n as one over n, one n over the minimum of one n. 
Okay, I just divide by the minimum. I don't know if the minimum is exponential, it's going exponential, but just divide by the minimum, okay? It's a way to fix, uh, let's say, every time the function is, uh, uh, is minimum one. It's a way, I could normalize by the average if you prefer, okay? Or the maximum, it's, it's just a normalization. Now, we prove, we start proving that the max of this function here is wrong. Okay, we start proving this. Okay, at least it will mean that the sequence, there is some uh, bound, you uniformly bounded in the sequence, okay? Because it will mean that at least it will be all between uh, one and the maximum, okay? Then we can start the, we can start seeing if it's a uniformly continuous and whatever, but at the minimum we have to prove this. Otherwise we have no way to have the convergence. Now, how we can do this? Okay. Divided by minimum. I divided by the minimum. So the minimum is one. I mean, I have the function one. Every time I, I pull back, so it stays a positive function. And I multiply by function e power five positive, so it's always positive function. I divide by the minimum, and I want to say at least the maximum does not go to infinity. This is the minimum, minimum we have to do in order to make the things work. Now, so let's prove it. Let's prove it. In order to prove this one, the maximum is bounded. So suppose that the maximum is bounded, okay? Why we do this? If so, let's say, prove this one. If so, if it's true that then the maximum is bounded, then you know that the max of one n plus m is less than the max m times the max one. This is just the computation. You do n times, and now I just put the maximum, and then I iterate other n times, okay? What possible state is this one? And I also know that the minimum of this will be at least the minimum, and the minimum, okay? It's the same. I start with the first m, then I take the minimum, and then I start. So minimum, minimum, I can have this one. If, uh, let's say, the max over the mean is less than a constant C, even bigger, I don't care, I can define lambda to be the inf of n of the max of 1n over 1 over n. OK, which is also the soup on n of the mean of one over n. So this is just an exercise, okay? If I have the sequence that's, uh, if, I, if I have a sequence such that, so the maximum is submultiplicative, the minimum is super multiplicative, and the ratio is bounded, I have this one. I can find more or less the rate exponential, which is this one. I'm not saying that the sequence will be exponential yet, maybe there are sub-exponential terms, but at least I can define lambda, okay? And once I have lambda, at least I can start studying the sequence being divided by lambda. And, okay, so how we prove this? So we want to prove this one, okay? At minimum. Now, the more we quantify, the better it is. But let, let's start, let's try to say how we can, how we can do this. And this will uh, justify why we spent uh, some hours discussing about uh, Laplace. So, two bound. In order to bound, let's say the max of the minimum of the function, we bound, let's say, oscillation of the minimum, which is max minus min over minimum. Okay, if I bound the, the maximum over min, minus minimum respect to minimum is the same as bounding the maximum. Okay, and now this is the point. So we want to bound. The oscillation of one star. Okay, I have this function normalized just by the minimum. I want to start proving the, the, the difference between maximum and minimum of this. Okay, now this comes the point the general idea 
where potential theory comes in the, in the play, where we spend time to do this estimate. The idea is that a bound on DDC, I will spend a moment now to say what it is, implies a bound on the oscillation of a function. If I have a function, real function on C, the DDC is something that says, okay, I take my function, so it takes a function G up to constant, okay? It's the Laplacian times Lebesgue, if G is C2, okay? Just take two derivatives, it's the Laplacian, okay? But it's an operator that sends function to measures, this is the point, okay? And the point is, if I have a bound on the Laplacian of a function, okay, this gives me a bound on the, on the maximum minimum of the function, okay? The point is that this is bug, but we spent some time in, uh, in this course to say that more precisely, if I have two functions, DDC less than DDC of H, which I mean, I take two functions, suppose that this is positive, okay? I take two functions and I do that, okay, the Laplace ones are positive on, say, on, say, on, on, on a list, okay? Two functions with positive Laplace ones. And this one, as a measure, is more than this, okay? This implies, that if H is bounded, then G is bounded. In some other explicit ways. Okay? If H is C0, G is C0. If H is uh, uh, C gamma older, AG is C gamma prime older for an explicit gamma prime. Okay? This is the, the idea of techniques that we use. If you have a bound between the two measures, you take the potential, which is this function here, of the measure, and if you have a bound between the measure, you have a bound on the regularity of the potentials. Okay? And now comes the point, if H is log E continuous, I will say now in a moment, G is a log E continuous. Maybe don't control the constant in the norm, but the P this time is the same. What is log P norm? Let me recall for the new. So, in the same way as I can define G C gamma as, uh, let's say, uh, let me define M of G R is uh, the max over all points of uh, the oscillation of G on B A R, okay? For all points I can take, I take all balls and reduce R, Okay, and let's say at ratio at, at, at uh, scale r, what is the oscillation, maximum minus minimum? Okay. Now, if a function is older, this is essentially the norm. The norm is the oscillation as a rate r over r gamma in, pra in practice. Another way to say that the oscillation of the older function is the norm older multiplied by r power gamma. Okay, is another way to say what is an older function. P1. P1, P1, yes, the spherical, I can take the bag, but yes, yes, yes. It's one of the reasons to take the, the P1, which is compact. So uh, I'm taking this. Uh. Now, C, G log P is the oscillation at radius R, but instead of dividing by this, uh, I take one plus log R power. Now, the idea is that r over gamma goes to zero as a power of gamma, okay? One over log r power p goes also to zero, but as infinite, exponentially weakly than, than an older function, okay? So it's a- so Are we picking a supremo over r? Yes, 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 I'm taking the, the supremo over the r, and uh, so this is the, yes. The, the point is that, let's say that for every, for every point and for every ball of radius r, the oscillation of the older function is bounded by this times r gamma, and the oscillation of a log continuous function is bounded by this one divided by this one. Now, this one is going to zero, this one is going to go to infinity. This is the point that I multiply or divide. So, this is the point. Yeah. Log p continue. Is this one? Okay. Uh, so this is the soup of R positive of this one. 
and there is a slope in, over the center. I already did this at the maximum over the center. So it's a. So log continuous means this. Log, point, log, point, log continuous means this one is just there because uh, uh, if air passes one, log air is a bad behavior. So it's a, just, just think of just the log. So it means that on every ball of radius r, the oscillation of my function is bounded by this norm and this factor one plus log f over p. Okay, as p is larger, the norm is stronger. Okay, if I have all p, it's not yet older; it's weaker than older. But it's uh, and now this one I can replace it by the log. For some p that may depend on on, on phi, for example, may depend on the on the on on on, on everything, but. It's, it's a log p. So in particular, in the same way that it's an old, the older one it is, uh, it will give some compact space for some compact estimate for, for the norm infinity, okay? Okay, so it makes sense to say on the complement, I have some uh, uh, compact estimate. So this is the, the one. And the point that we discussed is that if uh, this one here is all explicit, I have a loss in the older exponent a priori, if I do this general idea, but I don't have a loss in the log p norm. So it is the first indication that the log p norm is a good tool to use. More than this, if I have a sequence here, gn, all uniformly bounded by this, here all gn are uniformly bounded in the norm once they are all bounded in this way. Okay, so if I have a sequence of functions such that the DDC is all bounded by the same measure, and the measure I have to be able to control the potential, then all the potentials here are all bounded in the same way. This will be one of the, ing the ingredients to find the norm. Okay, so this is the first idea. Okay, this is the this first important idea. Okay, so the idea now, how do we prove that uh, the oscillation, what we want to prove this one? So the idea, we prove that there exists, uh, uh, let me call it, uh, I don't know, a new measure, positive, with good potential, okay, such that DDC, of one star n is less than mu. If I can prove that I have a measure, the same measure that works for all n and all the Laplacian all together are bounded by this. Let's say, for example, here I take positive plus negative part. Okay. If they are all bounded with by the same measure, if I can control the potential of this measure, this gives that the sequence here is uniformly bounded, and you can believe that it's a unit that it is equicontinuous because of this estimate. Okay. So all the point here now is to find the measure here such that it bounds all these objects here. We did this in lecture two or three in the case phi different from zero to explain just the idea. So in case if you want, you can go back and check lecture two is uh, for phi different from zero, why we can prove this one. It's a simplified case. Now let's do the general one. Let's see why. Okay, so now we want to prove this. Eh? Now, and then we will see that during the estimate that we'll do, we will see why we can get the norm. But first, for now, let's just start proving this one, okay? Let's just prove it the first theorem, the existence. So, so now you have to say you have to take DDC of even. Then I can divide by by put the start and just divide it by the minimum. It's not the point now, but this is the point. I have to compute this one. What is this one? It's essentially two derivatives. Okay, we did it carefully in some examples uh, during the course. Uh, but let's say I just compute this one formally. But formally, it is the DDC of some, let's say at the point y, okay, of f and x is equal to y of e by x plus phi f minus one of x. And now I should put g of x, but this one of x is a constant, okay? This simplifies, so here I should put one of x, which is a constant, okay? In general, I should put g, it will become more complicated, but we forget this. So let, let, let's just not put this one. Now, if I develop this, I have to do the DDC, which is the second derivative of all these terms. 
people here last week we recognized that we only we didn't have this term we only had here something that was the push forward of the lebeg okay it was a series with the lebeg that we estimated on friday with all the estimates now we do with pi so this one is the sum of f n of x is equal to y of e pi blah 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 pi minus n of what now i have, I have the sum j equals zero gdc of y And then I have the sum of, let's say, j, jl, maybe, jl is equal to zero, n minus one of d phi fj, when the d bar phi fj. Okay? Think of this, it's a real fun. Uh, if phi is smooth, all this is well defined, okay? I'm just saying that sometimes I differentiate two times the same term, which I get this. Sometimes I differentiate two different terms, I get the one. Okay, now for the sake of simplicity, we will forget this term. Okay, the point is that if phi is smooth, both these and these are bound by the Lebesgue. Up to, up, up, if phi is C2, both these, if you see phi is less than the, cons, the norm times the bag, and also d phi, which d phi, d phi is less than the same, okay? Actually, it's one square uh, Lebesgue. So, for sake of simplicity, since we are assuming that pi is smooth, uh, we forget this term here for now. Okay, I just treat uh, this term here. Of course, when pi is not smooth, this creates the most problems. But let's start from this one. Now, how do we estimate the series here? Now, the point here is that this one. Uh, up to the constant of the norm is Lebesgue, okay? It is the situ norm that Lebesgue, but it's evaluated along the orbit, okay? Now, and remember that x, x is in some sense, x is in f minus n of the point that I'm computing, because here I'm evaluating in y, okay? So in some sense, this is the Lebesgue on the j point of the orbit, but of an entry image. Which, which means that actually this is the is the example, this point here is n minus j times uh, behind the point, the point y at the beginning. Okay, I go back by n, but then I, I come back by j. Okay, so I, I have this switcher. The point here is that. Uh, yes. coming from, from f j. It is f yeah. j. f j. Yeah. yeah. The point is that I still I I still didn't compute this. It's inside the estimate. It is evaluated with this. It's still composed by this. Yes, yes, yes. It's still the composition. I give all the point. Very good point. I don't do it. I want to keep it inside because I want to use the dynamics to simplify all the terms. It's really the point. Yes, good. I keep it here. I don't use the derivative of f. Otherwise, it's uh, I put it inside. Now, the point is suppose that I have y. I have x, okay, and here I have fj u. Okay, here I have a lot of branches, but now once I fix f or g, I have a lot of branches going here, a lot of possibilities. Okay, so if I want to take this operator here, I fix j, for example, this one. What it is? But I have for a fixed j, this one. Ah, sorry, this one. Yes, so there is this one. Okay. This one is the kind of operator that say you work at times minus n, but then you have to put everything here. Okay, so this push from here to here, I can decompose the first push here and the second push here. Okay, this first push, there is no measure because the measure is, is at this time. So here I can split on e phi blah 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 in this part times e phi blah 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 in this part. Okay. Now, here, for this part here, I have to push forward both the measure and the function. I, have, I can do nothing more than put in the maximum of this. Okay, so we do this. So this is smaller than, the, let's say, the sum. Uh, this is like Fj star 
Now, I take uh, the max of pi j times, okay? The number of times here that I take, I just take the maximum, okay? I cannot do anything else. But the other part, here I can do something a bit smarter than take the maximum. For example, I use the transfer operator. In this part here, I can write as times L phi N minus J of my function, of my function. Okay, so if I want to compute this to four, first I use the transfer operator until here, and I just get the, the operator for this part, the beginning of the orbit. Once I get to have to push forward the product of a measure and the function, I cannot do nothing more than putting the maximum of the function. Okay, and then I push forward. Okay, so this is the estimate. I have the step of maximum, I have this push forward remaining, and this is push forward now because remember, this was a pullback. But we have to simplify by the n, so actually it's uh, it's a, it still needs j times to end the finish. I mean, yes, I swapped uh, an index, but it's this one. Now, if now I have to divide this, uh, suppose that now I divide by the minimum. So remember that now I have to divide by the minimum, it's star n. Okay, what is the minimum of the minimum of this? This is at least uh, the minimum. Of ln minus j one times d j e minimum of phi j times. Okay, this is the minimum. I can split at any moment. I take sometimes the minimum, but sometimes I use this operator. Why I do this? Because now this divided by the minimum is less than sum. Now I have e j max. Minus mean of phi divided by j. I have this here uh, L uh, but, uh, yes, so I put uh, okay, this one. I put max over min. Of L n minus j of phi of one. I divide the maximum. I can put the maximum here if I want. And I divide by the minimum. I have the norm of the And I have this problem. People here, last, last week we recognized that we didn't have this term, but it's the series that we have series of push forward of Lebeck. Okay? Now it's still a series of push forward of Lebeck. But now we have these steps here to, to understand. Okay. But now, believe me that by induction, this one, it's what we are trying to prove actually that the maximum over the minimum is bounded. Okay. So by induction, say that this one will be bounded. Okay. If I, could, if I keep going. At step n, I, I know that all the previous ones were bounded by some constant. So this is not a problem. What is this one? This is E omega of pi, the oscillation, divided by D power j. Okay, it's just this. Omega phi, g over g. Now, and I have the condition, this one, I hope I built it, but omega of phi, we said it's less than the log of d. So it's precisely to have this one geometrically. So this is less than a constant times this. Okay? So this becomes a series. Remember that before, in, in the other week, we didn't have this, this, but we had the dj, okay? This we say, even if we put phi, it's still geometrical. It's not d, but it's still geometric, okay? So this means that it's smaller than some bj, depending on this coefficient here, fj of omega. And now you see why last week, even if it was one term, we put all the series, okay? Some ask the why we put all the series to estimate one term. It's because it will come out in this setting. So now for every n, we have this estimate. For example, I can put infinity here. Okay, now these are all probability measure, so the mass is always one. This is geometric, so this is well defined. We did last week, you can go and check in there. I will not do the, the computation now, but the point is that this is something for which we can estimate the potential in normal log p. We did all the computation on Friday for this, so now we keep it for we can take it for granted. But the point is that this series here we can estimate in log p naught. 
Okay. Now let me let me see how much time is there if I can. If you, you, if you want to make the break. It's too late. Okay. Now, okay, so the point is this series here. Let me let me say what's the problem. Here this is smooth, okay? But if you put forward the smooth uh, potential, it becomes older. If I put forward the gain, it's still older, but even weaker than older. I mean, older becomes weaker and weaker. For example, it is I can just expect that it's gamma older over dj, the, the potential, okay? This is the degree, this is the only estimate. But the point is that we can put some estimates here in norm infinity, in norm log p, in norm whatever, in order to get that this one, this series is log p. Again, if you have a question, I, I, I'm happy to answer. Otherwise, it, it's, it's a lecture three that I put as a technical lemma in order not to have it today. So the point is that this series here, you can bound in log p. So at least uh, it means that for all n, the DDC of this object here divided by the minimum, what we want it, is bounded by the measure for all n. The potential is uniformly continuous for all, is log p continuous. And so you have the uniformly con continuity and uniformly bound for all the sequence. This uh, up to start some up standard method as Koyazela, the limit gives raw, the whatever. Okay, this completes the proof of theorem. But the, 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 the idea is really to move all the estimates of inverse branches, if you want to estimate the regularity of a function to in this series. And this is the point not compute the derivative of f, okay, but move them in this series here. And now we use the part here. The ingredient we used last week is that we know that. Uh, the measure of maximal entropy is exponentially missing. This gives a good control for this iterate here. Okay? This, the, this control here that we did last week comes from the property that we know, for example, the, of the, we can write omega as a measure of maximal entropy plus this here of some function. This becomes the put forward of this function and study put forward of function is the same as studying pull back of measure. And this is the problem for the measure of maximal entropy. Let just me say that here there is no phi. Here we, we move to a problem with no phi. So once we can do it for the measure of maximal entropy, we can do it. Okay? Here phi is appealing. So whatever we can do for the maximal entropy from this point, phi is appear. Okay? And this we can do it. Okay, I say that we need estimate more precise than what were done, were done for the maximal entropy. And we did the estimate in log p that we just could estimate, but it's not the point today. Now, the point today, uh, let, let, yes, since I'm here, let me just do a comment. If phi is not CG, actually, this is enough if phi is log p continuous for some p larger than C. You can prove the exercise the following that if a function is older, you can decompose the older function into parts, one epsilon small in norm infinity. And the other one C2. And as epsilon goes to zero, the C2 norm diverges polynomially in one over epsilon. This is a property of all the functions. Log P functions have this property. If you cut into parts one epsilon small in norm infinity, the other one C2, the norm C2 diverges sub-exponentially if P is at least two. So if here I replace phi with something which is log P, I just have a norm here, all this term of norm of phi that diverges sub-exponentially. We change nothing in the estimates. Okay? So even if phi is not C2, but it's just log P continuous, which is very weak, weaker than older, the estimates are really the same because I just put here something that diverges sub exponentially, but is killed by this one. Okay? Of course, if it's older, it's even better, it's a polynomial, but it's uh, even for log P norm, for log P norm, it's enough because it's killed by this part here of the term. Okay? Now, here I did it for one. If I put G, you believe me that you have some other term with the DC of G, and they will be estimated in a similar way. But these one are those without P, and so these are the one that we can do with the measure of maximum entropy. So the point really estimating this one. Now, how can we do, how we can use the, all these to get the norm? How we can get the norm from this? Because now we say that I start with phi, even log P and G, maybe smooth or whatever, and I find that this is bounded in log P for every P. But it doesn't mean that uh, if I start with now log p, log p, it's bounded in the same log p. So it's uh, a priori have a loss. So how we quantify this convergence in some norm, which still we didn't see.
Now, the idea is the following. Let me recall that for pi equal to zero, there is the norm which is respect to the okay. norm. The problem is that it has no relation with the older norm. This is the so-called GSH norm. If I define the norm GSH as the minimum of the mass of mu plus or minus, such that BDG of DDC of G is mu plus minus mu minus. Okay, I take this as a form. Okay, I decompose in positive negative parts. I take the best possible decomposition and I take the mass of these two parts. Now, by homology, these two have the same mass. Okay, now if I take this minimum, this gives a norm, semi norm, okay, up to constants. Got constant, we have zero, but up to the constant, which we know that they are fixed for the pi equal zero, this gives a norm. Now, if I try to study the transfer operator, this, this one is not difficult to see. If I take x star of DDC of G, this is DDC of x star of G. Here I use that there is no weight in order to commute these two terms. Okay, f star of this is this one. This is f star of mu plus minus f star of mu minus. Okay. These two have the same mass as before. So this one is less than one over D, GDS. So you want, if I just want the spectral gap, so pi equals zero, here it is. Okay. And we can do a group different from this using proper to subharmonic function, which gives the convergence. So if we wanted the norm for the spectral gap just for pi equals zero, here it is. Two problems. One, all their maps in general do not satisfy this, uh, are not bounded. In, so there is no relation. And these, I mean, all they will not satisfy these, and these will not satisfy all. They're completely negative. This function can be everywhere discontinued. It's, it's, a, it's a condition on the DDC if you want, so second derivative, but in the distributional sense. So it's, it has no implication with all. Second and main problem is as soon as I try to perturb the transfer operator, this break. So and you don't have the second property that you want, it's stability by perturbation. And for those who know a bit about statistical properties, this is the real problem that one wants to know to have the stability by perturbation. Okay, so this one doesn't work, but it's an ingredient. And we also know that the log p norm is work. It doesn't work because it's a, it doesn't work yet. We just have the convergence, but it's also a good ingredient. It has good estimate for the DDC, and we have a convergence in non-block p. So the first step is try to use these norms. Let's, let's define this norm. Definition. I define the norm P to be the norm of DSH plus the norm of. Okay. I start with this one. Now, if I try to estimate things in this norm, let's try to do it. But I, I delete it here. But if I try to estimate this, uh, okay, I'm sorry. The definition is this. Oh, this is the definition. Yeah. Okay. You take a function on P1, yeah. you take the Laplace term in the sense of uh, two differential operator, so it becomes a measure. You take two derivatives, it's, it becomes a true form. You decompose positive negative part. You have maybe more ways to do it, but you take the best possible to write in this way with minimal mass of. I am sorry. Yeah, about... sorry. Yes. 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 There is a, I'm too There is a one-hour record. So okay. Yeah, we did one lecture about on this. Yes, so it's a, but yeah, it's a norm on the second derivative. You take the second derivative and you bound it. And the important point of this is that it works well with the push forward, 
because the push forward of F is exactly isolomorphic, commute with this operator. And so if you have the DDC of a push forward, you would commute, you would go here, and the mass is preserved on measures. You use the gap between the action on function and the action on measure. An action on measure, one goes to one is a mass. For functions, you expect that constant goes to D. So you can divide by D here, and you get the gap. Wait, so this peak is in the long or is this just a thing? Seminormal. It's still a thing. So it's still seminormal because we always work with the, we can always work now since we did the first outside of the line. Uh, I mean, we can take the line of invariant of, of the multiple of rho. We can always take now function which has zero integral with respect to the, to the measure of theorem one. And now we know that things will go to zero. Okay, so on this space of those of integral zero with respect to this measure, it becomes a normal. Yes, 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 good. There's only this. So we just take out the line which is invariant for the dynamics now. Since we now we have lambda, we have everything, and we try just to say, okay, now we want a contraction. Okay, so if I write down this estimate here. So are we back to the study where we got five? Yes, sure. Yes, yes, yes. And now, now we retake the estimate of before, but now we have lambda, for example. We already give this trick to get this to get to define what is lambda, because now this is bounded. So we prove theorem one. This is bound, this is uniformly continuous. You have the limit, you have rho, you have the distribution, you have lambda. And you already you can prove it's the pressure and all this, but leave it there. But now there is lambda. So if I restart and do the estimate that I did before, I get to something like this uh, the sum Jn e omega phi over d power j of uh, F of the star of the length. Okay, this is what we say there. Okay, this is this, uh, this one here. Now, now I'm working with a more general norm. So here I have to say this is a bar. Okay, this is the if, if before I didn't replace the DC of pi by with the leg, I had this one. Okay, now I had another term. I will also have the terms like this. If I wedge the phi FJ level. There was the now we cannot use the C2 norm to estimate this term. But believe me, this one is another technical lemma that I prefer not to give. If do if you have this estimate, if you have this this one here, this is bounded by G P H. Now, you can ask me what is this on measure. The point is that in the same way that I can define a pump, something here, actually this comes from the fact that the, for a measure, alpha, forma, this I define as the minimum of the field point to the negative parts, okay? And then if you want the norm of GSH of G, I can define as the DDC, of G in this norm. Okay, I can first define a norm measure and then I say, okay, this is comes, actually comes from a definition of measures. So I can define the same norm actually here on measure. Okay, the DDC, and for the OP, I can take the potential. But the point is that I, for this norm, I don't have to care about the next step. Okay. And now what I want to say is that uh, again, some estimates that uh, have been done and didn't want to do today in the in, in the final construction. Here you have, uh, this becomes a GDC of this. Now this is a function which is bounded in the SH and bounded in log B, okay? People here will know that on Friday, we did a theorem that precisely does the deterioration of this. It is a kind of exponential speed of convergence against a log P function with bounded the SH norm. Which is weak, it cannot be get by interpolation. It was the estimate we did with Skoda. Okay, but the point is that this series here 
is well controlled in log norm and goes to zero geometrically in normal infinity. This is enough to say that if this is log p, all the potential is log q continuous for some q species. So what I'm saying is that here we start with a smooth to get the one with log p, but even if you start with some log p, it's the same, you just need to get log q, which is smaller. Now, is it enough to do the norm? No, because we want to estimate this in the same norm. We would like to get the same log p, for example. This log p will be log p. Explicit, it is explicit. But this, again, we did all the technical part in lecture three for this. Now, how we can do this? So how we can improve this to make it become a norm? Now comes the idea, maybe the main point that should pass in this, uh, in this course here. Well, the general point is the estimate of the potentials. The DDC implies the regularity. But for this precise construction, the main point is the following. Once you notice that you always have a series to estimate, okay, you don't try to estimate the series, but you put the series in the norm, and you make the norm estimate itself with the series. So you can define, uh, let's say for a new, so let's put it down from G, I take alpha, I take P, it is the minimum of the C, such that DDC of G, is less than the sum C times G, alpha J, F J star of S, with S bounded in P. Or if you want, S is DDC of H, with H bounded in the log P. Okay. So you have a series here now. This norm that I say that doesn't work, you put in the series, you put it here. You do the dynamical series with this one. Now this is log P and uh, DSH bounded. You do the general geometric series. And now this one, you know that this one bounds log P for some species Q, okay? So you have a norm which bounds log Q, okay? Because of the estimate you said here with last time. So this norm here at least defines a space, uh, is, uh, it bounds this one, and of course it's bounded by this two norm, because if you have a C, if you are C2, this is fine, okay? It's just enough one there. So this is the version of the geometrical, the dynamical series for phi different from zero. Last time it was enough to put the back here. This time, since we want to use things non smoother, we have to put something more, less regular here. Okay, so you take something bounded in DSH and log P, you take the geometric, the dynamical series, okay? You know that the result, you, you, at some point, you stop trying to estimate the, the norm which, which contracts, because it doesn't contract. Every time you start with older, it loses older, the series. You start with the log P, it will become log Q. You start with what you want, and you don't even converge. So you say, okay, I, let's put this in the norm. And now the point is that if I estimate uh, F star of G, this norm, this is less than one over alpha g alpha. Because if I apply f, I just shift all the series and I lose a factor one over alpha. Okay, so if alpha, I take it very close to one, in particular, more than the, the, the space allowed by the gap omega phi and d, okay, imagine alpha very, very close to one, this one contracts. Now, this one still doesn't work. Why? Because this property here that we use is fine for this norm, what you use here, but no one says that I can estimate TDC of a product, let's say, with the, DG and, and DH. So if I have to do products, which in practice is mixed term when I come with the derivative, this is GDC of G times H times G GDC of H plus some terms of this form. And then there will be the other mixed terms. If I have a bound on this norm, I can bound this term, I can bound this term, but I cannot bound this term. So the mixed term is not true anymore that with this norm I can bound it. 
So this is an extra problem. I solved all this part, the part coming from the SMA GTC, but as soon as phi different from zero, it was a problem that was not, not, not there with phi equal zero. You have all the parts with this mixed term that you cannot estimate because this is a norm on two derivatives. And a priori, as far as I know, a norm like this cannot estimate this term of you. Okay, so now you have a norm which works well with the shift if you want with the iteration, but you lose a part of, of, of the estimate you have to do. All this one. So now we get the almost final norm, which is one way to, which works. The only problem is that at some point we have to get rid of the DDC to make it contain the older norm. This is point. This one up here doesn't contain older. It's not clear with older functions. But the norm which works is that instead of doing this, you replace this by dg to edge the band. Okay, and here I just put two because it has to be linear. So it's a, so this is the norm. Okay, it's a C1 norm. I take this operator here, but it is. Now, if I do here, we wedge the bar, B wedge DGH, wedge the bar D8, this is bounded by something like this of the two, up to some normal limits. This is okay. If I modify in this way the series, this is still fine. This is fine this time. So this one is fine. So it means now if I take this modified definition, one, mixed terms are bounded. Okay. Again, as before, I can forget this part. And actually, because I changed the estimates, instead of estimating this, I estimated this. I, I estimated this other norm now. I still go back to estimate with DDC because I cannot go get rid of the DDC. This is the point because here the potential is a DDC. So I, I, you could say, okay, why are you starting with the DDC? This is in the potential. You cannot get rid of the DDC. Now, this works with the mixed terms. Okay. It's a bit more complicated to see, but this, proper, this uh, norm still works well with this property. Now it's not so clear that you just have a shift because you have a DOH the bar. If you put X star, X star here, it's not so clear that it works, but it's, it works. It still works with the shift. But uh, you may tell me there is a problem. See, till. And the problem is that from day one, I started with this. A bound on the DDC of a function gives a bound on the oscillation. If I use this norm, I lost the property. Even if I can bound this, even if I can bound with a series which is very good, even if it contracts, do I have uh, some regularity of, of this function? It means if I have this less than DDC of, uh, let's say, function H, so this will be a measure. So the only thing I can put is the potential. If this is less than DDC H, even if H is not. If, in which norm I can bound this? This is not clear. I mean, a priori, this general lemma that I said that DDC implies a, of a function implies oscillation. Now stays because we cannot use it. Now the solution for this is that not this is not an estimate that I can do here. This will be a this is longer, but it's still true that DG DG bar less than DDCH implies that the oscillation of the of R is bounded by the oscillation of G of R. Now, I don't say what is this one. It, it's not a constant, okay? It just, it just bug. It just says that some function of, uh, of this is bounded by this. But in particular, this uh, implies that if H is log P, V is log Q for some explicit. So I'm not claiming something at the level of older, but I'm claiming it at the level of log P. If I have this estimate, this, come, this comes from really potential theory. So this is not short, so I'm not doing that. But if this is log P, even with some bound, this will be log Q explicit. So you, everything I said, okay, it's fine. Now I can restart and say, okay, it's enough to bound the log P here because then it will give the log Q of this function, okay? So the, with this lemma, we are saved that we can use the general method that I say to bound the DDC bounds and oscillation is still true because it bounds even if I use this other operator here. And then this norm works, this norm is better now. Because now it's well defined, I can use this one, it shifts, and it's naturally done to, to, to work well with, with, the, with the bounded term, with the, with the product terms. Okay. 
Now, almost over. This is a petrol gap. You may ask, but I want the norm that, that bounds there. I mean, all their norm, all their functions should work. I almost done. I have to say to find the norm which, come for, which is bounded for all, all their norms. So how to find? So we have to find, remember, A, a norm like this, uh, which is bounded by pump holder. For every gamma, you have to find this uh, and this. OK? Now, the norm that we did until now, it's fine for me, OK? Because it's a series of things that we have everything estimated. Log P, it's fine. So this would be fine. But the point is, you want this. Because if it's all this work is done, just to find another variation of DSH for function that a priori are not even continuous, because a priori functions for now in this norm, I mean, no, they are all log Q, OK? But we only know for now that this is C2. I mean, C2 is fine. C2 are, are, are OK here. But if the function is older, we don't know if it's bound in this norm. So the problem is, how do we get the, the, the gamma here? This is really the last step. And this is why I didn't do the interpolation before. In the same way, as you define all their functions, as this game of uh, you split a function into parts, G that I can decompose in C1 epsilon, C1 epsilon. Let's say G1 epsilon infinity less than epsilon, and G2 epsilon, C gamma less than one over epsilon power, something related to gamma. Maybe say gamma over two, whatever. So this is essentially all the functions, okay? So functions that are polynomially approximated by C2 function. OK, this is the other norm here. Now I could define the norm alpha P gamma in the same way. I cut into parts. This is the same. And this one, I ask the G2 epsilon in my norm alpha P is less than 1 over epsilon. I do an interpolation, OK? Function, so this norm plays somehow the role of C2 functions now. And in the same way as I build all their starting from C2, and then I can do interpolation, the theory. Here I start with this weak uh, C2, or C1, actually, if you want to call it. <laughs> and then I define all them in the same way by interpolation. So these are my older alpha. In the same way that C2 dominates my norm, older now dominates my norm. So I found the norm. This one is bounded by the norm C gamma. And since I even did an interpolation, it's, uh, I didn't change much. So this is still uh, with the norm. So this norm here now is a gap. Because we, this norm alpha P is the gap. By the by interpolation, it's a bit technical to write, but uh, you better believe me that. If I do that by interpolation, something that is fine on the analogy of C2, I get the I, I get the one, and I get the one here. Okay. And after if I had the gap gamma beta before, now it becomes a beta power gamma or something like this. It's just interpolation. So once we are here, okay, we found the norm. The norm is contracted by the transfer operator, up to taking maybe an iter of the F, but there are I, I forgot these, these details, but it's fine. So you have a norm. Is this essentially the same norm for P and G? Okay, so the problem is really symmetrical. The weight and the function play essentially the same role. And uh, okay, now all the motivation of statistics that you may want, now it's fine. Every property of possible statistical study, once you have the spectral gap, it may be technical to write it down, okay? But in practice, uh, it should be true. It's uh, once you have the spectral gap. It also properties like the local central limit theorem of large deviations of this, which is not quite clear how to get with it, is weaker control. Okay, so I hope that I gave last week some details and today at least some ideas of uh, how to build this norm. And uh, more important than this norm, I hope that I gave the flavor on how techniques from potential theory can be used to study a problem, even if we perturb a complex problem in a real one. This is really the point. The fact that they can study the measure of maximum entropy is a complex problem. There's no real perturbation with phi. So it's somehow natural that problem using subharmonic function can work. Here, the idea that should pass is that a combination of these techniques with some more hard estimate, for example, this one, can prove something even with real perturbation of a complex operator with techniques coming from potential theory, which are, and especially stable by perturbation, which is something that I do not talk to the other 
Okay, thank you for the support. Questions? Did you say that you use? Oh, oh, oh. No, no. Uh, so what? What was the story about? Um, you said that it also works. You multiply by a constant, close to one. Mul multiply by a constant. Uh, it's more this that if I take a five, and if I take u bounded. Okay. In the same norma, everything works in for this one in a very uni in a uniform way. T. So for all these, if t is close to zero, I can take the same norm and follow the gap for all of them. Because the point is that if they are bounded in the same norm, there is some perturbation theory saying, okay, the gap I can follow it. But once it's not, you have to have a norm for which all these are bounded. So first you have to bound, you find the norm for which all these operators. Are bounded with respect to the same norm. Then you can apply perturbation theory. So the point is really founding a norm which is in, in independent of phi in particular. So then also the lambda should be independent of phi. So develop something that doesn't depend on phi. I mean, depends on phi in a class, but not on phi specific. Oh, I'm a bit confused. So, so we say we have fixed phi. Uh, yes. Uh, so you're saying that for every u and t. We will, uh, this break will be bounded, so you can apply the yeah. theory. Yes. Okay. I mean, because here I did use pi, but you can replace in all the machines pi plus tu. And you just use the norm of pi plus tu. And it's, uh, it's, it's close to the norm of phi. In, uh, in the... So, yes, the point is, uh, but it's not clear why it's possible. The, 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 the best possible example, again, is the norm of the SH. The norm of the SH has, has a gap for this, which is pi plus zero. But as soon as pi different from zero, you have the transfer operator. This is not even bounded. This is the best example. If, even if you have a norm for pi equals zero, which okay. is bounded to gap or whatever, even, even a gap, it does not guarantee that as soon as you perturb pi, go to zero, so which means zero plus pu. This is not even still bounded for you. Well, but if you use the EHA perturbation theory, then why? <laughs> Yeah. I mean, provided L is not. Yeah. So what you're saying is L is not bounded in that case? Uh, it's uh, again, no, DSH, no, because we say that we need these estimates to perturbate, for example. We need them. As soon as you perturbate, you get mixed terms. The mixed term DSH cannot bound it. So DSH doesn't work. You can have a norm that like this. This works, but by perturbation. If you do a norm like this at the place of the SH, this works by the small perturbation. This works, but only dimension one. This is quite specific because we have precisely with only dimension one. So this, if I start with this operator and do the gap here, this is true. For this one, yes, the perturbation would work because I can stand by the mixed term, but with the SH, no. But this one, yes, but only dimension one. While the SH works, it will work in a dimension. But this, so if I replace the SH by this, the answer is yes. The perturbation I can apply to this one, only in dimension one. For example, the local center limit theorem was already known for rational maps for phi equals zero, precise of this. I mean, it's not, uh, but in higher dimension, the same method doesn't work. It was doing Guyen to Sibon. Do you get exponential mixing and for which functions and so bounded in this norm? I mean, you have the spectral gap for uh, once pi is bounded in this norm, let's say, and g is bounded in this norm, it has integral zero with respect to this uh, m phi. You have an exponentially converged to zero, and for this, uh, this one, for all g bounded in this norm and integral zero. This gives uh, exponential mixing, this gives multiple decorrelation. It gives uh, uh, almost an invariant principle. This gives everything. And you have an estimate of the speed. Yeah. No, 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 no. I, 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 wait, for, for the radius, yes, 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 yes. Yes, we have estimates. It's explicit for the speed of convergence, speed of mixing, which depend on the degree, gamma, if you put, I mean, alpha to gamma, whatever. And the point is that all these estimates 
as alpha goes to one, p go to infinity, and gamma go to what two, they tend to the optimal one for uh, for five for the maximal. Number. So they they tend all to in practice one over d. They as soon as you send all the parameter to the the best possible, they all converge to the optimal one known for the for the maximal entropy. <laughs> but yes, they are explicit all of them. And in some sense, somehow optimal because again, this dependence goes to the optimal one. It's, uh, More questions? No. It's no. online. No. I'm not turning it on. What's that? No. I don't think that. I don't think so. Something wrong with this machine. Yeah. I don't think. But there is connection. Yes, there is connection. It is that someone wanted to get the work. Okay, so thank you. Thank you.